Daniel, you spoke about how, how do we sort of educate workers? Uh, how do they understand that it's in their own interest to fight against secrecy, to fight for more transparency? Uh, when we talk about Colombia, uh, narco trafficking, guerrillas, you know, 50 year old uh, war, it seems very removed from a Norwegian reality. It seems very removed from a European reality, a, a US reality. Um, so, uh, sort of in that context, it, it seems less dramatic. We're more sedated up here in, in the north um, uh, with our welfare state and all that. So, how do we educate the Norwegian workers in this? How do we, um, how do we sort of get this through um, to create some action? Hi. Um, I mean, that, that's essentially my my challenge to people. Um, now. It is the case that some of the things that go on in a place like Colombia um, seem very, very far away from, from people here. But I think the point that was made is that some of the institutions, the global institutions, that create the circumstances for conflict and dysfunction um, are created by the actions or inactions of the governments of, of, the, of the richest countries in the world. Um, and, the, and the people in Colombia have very little ability to influence the actions of, of European or American or the rich country governments, the people who can influence those uh, are, are going to be the, the citizens, the, the ordinary workers. Um, and, and so that's our, that's our challenge if we want to make a difference. Um, and there's a limit to what, how we're going to be able to uh, mobilise the workers, for example, of Norway by appealing to their altruistic instincts about somebody in Colombia, there's just a limit to which you're going to be able to explain their story, make the connections, uh, even talk to them about their own self-interest. If, for example, they're suffering from public service cuts or rises in the cost of living uh, or, uh, or, or insecure employment. And so what I'm saying is, is what we need to do is, is talk to workers and citizens in rich countries about the things that matter to them and do so with no guilt uh, because actually they're the same thing that matter to workers all over the world, and if you can get them mobilised, then you can actually get the, the government of Norway or, or other governments to do things uh, that, that actually can change things. I mean, I, in, in practical terms, what I like about today is that we've got journalists in the room. I think journalists have a very, very important uh, role to play in this. I mean, despite all of the work that so many of us have done in the last 10 years, ultimately last leaks in Panama Papers uh, have supercharged the tax debate. Uh, and have been done everyone in the normal service. Our task is to assist that to occur, but perhaps more important, because these things, now, a journalist will look for the story. Perhaps the most important thing to do is, once they do occur, is to keep on fanning the flames um, and keep on making it real to workers. So for our unions, for example, we're talking to people about public services. We're talking to people about the fact that if they allow corporations not to pay taxes, then they will pay more taxes. And we talk to people about justice inequality and the way in which there are massive amounts of, uh, of money that's gone offshore. And I think people, most people get that. Most people understand that. Um, how they interpret it is, is the question. And if you look at the election in America, what we saw is a lot of angry people basically getting what was going on and just interpreting it in a way that perhaps I certainly wouldn't agree with. So what that is is a failure of, of interpretation of, of, of what people actually feel in any event. So I think that's what that's what we do. That's what unions should be doing. Because in Norway, uh, workers are maybe more occupied with refurbishing their bathroom than, than uh, caring about what's going on in Colombia. Uh, how I mean, you asked for the word, but I don't know if that's what you want to answer. Um, how do we how do we educate people on this? Uh, I think we are Keep the microphone giving closer. ourselves too much of a progressive role. I think as well as among uh, among we are giving ourselves uh, too much of a no, it's okay, just keep it closer. Okay. <laughs> Again, the third time. We are giving ourselves too much of a progressive role that we, we are going to educate people and, uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> and things like that. I, I think that there are, some, there are a lot of progressive people in uh, the union movement in, uh, in Northern Europe and, uh, and they are very aware of that, uh, even though they care about the bathroom. Why isn't union membership uh, falling? So, so, so here's, here's what, uh, what you can do with, uh, for example, Norway had uh, this uh, uh, NOU, I don't know what it's called, the uh, routine uh, uh, 
uh, utredning eller något det skall in which in in uh, kind of research report public research report uh, on uh, on tax havens but they, i don't think they they said the rest the obvious there's an obvious recipe in in the fight against tax havens and that is a boycott and the boycott is of course not against um, it, it is against the country that has the tax haven and and the country is very dependent on international trade so that means that countries that care, they should uh, have a boycott against, say, Switzerland. Or, that, and, and of course, every, because it is stealing. It is, as just as many people have said, it is stealing from uh, other countries. And, and it's not, it, it has to be so much of a threat to Switzerland that it pays for authorities, the government in Switzerland, to instruct their banks that they have to be completely transparent about. You, they can do the banking the way they like, but they have to be transparent about it. If they are transparent about it, then we stop. Uh, <coughs> and I think this is a very powerful uh, weapon uh, against uh, tax havens. Uh, and with too little discussed, and uh, I think sort of the, the unions, on, uh, say in Northern Europe, are, are too much interested in sort of the, uh, things that compete with them directly, uh, uh, child labor and uh, country acts. Um, I can only say maybe they care even about the, the children, uh, but sometimes they also care about the self-interest. But it, uh, here they can be educated in in a sense that they understand that uh, that when, as somebody said, you just you said that uh, if if uh, Google doesn't pay taxes, uh, then other companies have to pay more, uh, and other citizens have to pay more, and. So the, the boycott can be in the self-interest, but they have to be collective rational in, in that sense. You have to... Uh, so one more thing. It, it, I think Colombia is, is different from Norway, but it's not that different from the world in a hundred years per perspective. And I think it's important to remind ourselves about certain things. Even a country like Sweden and Norway and, uh, and Finland have the very high amount of conflict in, uh, in the industrial organization uh, or in the, in the labor relations uh, prior to 1935. Uh, Finland had a civil war, as you remember. So uh, the, the, I, I think people forget too easily. Uh, and and the, the, there are differences in conflicts, but the conflicts are, are sort of, you, you, you really spoil cooperation games. That the gains that they can be held, specialization, you can't specialize if you have a conflict going on. You can't, there's a lot of things, as I said, that you, you, you can't do that could be to the benefit for everybody if you can get this done. So it, it is in a pure form, as I said, in Colombia, but it is in a, and you get it more and more in Europe these days, actually, that you have conflict in the sense of uh, absence of cooperation. But it's also about the complexity, John. It's, it's hard for uh, normal people to understand the complexity of this issue. It's easier to relate to child labor, for example. Or... Sure, but it's about quality of information. Uh, I was speaking to a group of journalists. Uh, it's about quality of, journal of, of, of information, information from journalism, but also information from academics as well. The problem is we, of course, live in a moment as well where we're supposedly in a, a, a post-truth uh, society now, where we're no, no one trusts any word whatsoever. Um, and their only way to get beyond that is actually to sort of try to put meat back on the bone, to demonstrate very clearly that there is knowledge, there is something that's hard and fast and can be grasped. And that demands actually for, uh, you know, essentially cooperation between journalists and academics and, and civil society organizations. They're very important. Um, what I wanted to say was that, you know, which is a little bit in the line of Carla, was that, that you know, that, that development over time doesn't go just in one direction. Right? We've all presumed in Norway that things would just get better. It would get better and better. You know, we had the oil, it was just we were going to get more and more prosperous forever. You know? So uh, there was talk only, uh, only two years ago about how, you know, how, our, how our, our prosperity was going to three, was, become, going to become, was going to triple over the next ten years. Well, look what's happening now. Right? The oil price has fallen, uh, the economy is not doing so well. Uh, there are all these other concerns. This links, of course, into some concerns about, about migrants coming into the country. So the atmosphere is completely turned around. The whole, the whole, that journey of development that we all assumed would, would, would you know, continue <coughs> its, its merry pathway, that's not happening anymore. 
And I think that it's a real moment for us to wake up in Norway, to wake up and recognise that, that we have to get back, we have to get engaged again. You mentioned that, oil, you know, that, that union membership is dropping. It's dropping all the way through Northern Europe. What's happening around us should be a reminder that you know, we shouldn't be just buying newspapers, we should be joining union organisations you know, to finally start to deal with these issues together because it, it is very serious. Now going back to Colombia, one of the things that I can say about Colombia is that it has an enormously, an extremely active civil society. Its union organisations, its civil society organisations are enormously active. Why? Because of course they face the threats every day. They haven't given up because they, they couldn't give up. They, you know, the, the danger for them of giving up was that they were then going to be stamped on. They were going to be killed. So they couldn't give up. So I think it's, you know, if we can draw something out of that example of Colombia, it is that Norway and Norwegian workers should wake up. But am I wrong that it's less than 10% of the Colombian workforce is unionized? Or? Yeah, that's fair enough. But there, there, there are the, the reasons for that have to do, to do with the that the, there is actually limited, um, limited heavy industry in the country. Uh, and it has also to do with, of course, the way in which, you know, essentially the, the dominant political message in <laughs> Colombia has been a message of market economics, of liberalism, of neoliberalism. And so there's been a, a, ter a very clear discouragement from political elites to, for workers to organize. But whereas they haven't organized as unions, they have organized as civil society organizations. And so I think that it has to be, and you can say the same thing about many countries in Africa as well, is that many countries in Africa don't have very strong union organizations, but they do have many civil society organizations. What we need to try and create is more and more connections and uh, cooperation between these types of organizations so they can work on these issues together. Cool. Yeah, um, yes, uh, one additional reason to, to be interested in war and conflict is that Norway has participated in some of them. And uh, I think it's a, it is, it's a scaring lack of interest in, in the fact of being involved, say, in Afghanistan, as I mentioned. But most likely, the, the, the war in Afghanistan, Afghanistan increased the power of Taliban enormously. They gave them a, a, a funding. They gave them a funding of uh, the taxes on the uh, open population that uh, made them stronger. More weapons, they can buy more weapons, and it is a consequence of attacking, not them, but attacking people. So the strongman, the local strongman in the area can demonstrate that he can protect the opium producers uh, in the area. So, it, and I think we have to, at least since we are involved in these wars, that's, this is not the only one, then we have to also study and discuss a little bit the consequences of it. Social organizations in Colombia are also a new sort of landless organization, uh, you know, landless farmers and so on. And you, have to, you will see more of that if, if uh, there's less violence in the, in the rural area. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the point that was made about the role of the state in this idea of equilibrium. Because people do often forget that one of the main roles of the state is to um, regulate the tension between capital and labour. And we forget about it because it's, for almost 100 years, it's, in, in Europe at least, it's been done reasonably well, um, with, with some uh, uh, exceptions. Um, but in a, what we're seeing is with a concentration of power with capital, we're increasingly be able to shift the balance of where that equilibrium falls. And that's been experienced all over the world. Um, and, it, and workers experience it by defining living standards, defining <laughs> civil liberties, uh, and, and, and living more and more in fear. And, and when workers experience that, then they've got some choices. And one of it is to fight back. And that's where conflict bubbles up and you see it. Um, and I think that's in, it's important to remember if you ask the question about how we speak to citizens. If, you're, if you feel that your, your standard of living is going backwards, if you feel like that you're, the next generation is less likely to live as well as the previous generation, then you might want to think a little bit about who's making the rules in your society and, and where that equilibrium falls. And, and, and part of that is having the debates. And this is it's really interesting about secrecy. I mean, a lot of these things that happen are hidden. And they're hidden for a good reason. And it's because if people knew about them, they'd get very angry. And so just having the debate is, is a win for those who want to, to, to readjust that balance. And when you look in Europe, of, of the two, in my opinion, major things that have occurred in tax in the last five years, um, neither of them happened. Um, they both basically happened because the debate was happening. Uh, and also because people, people were getting, politicians were, were feeling pressured. And one was the financial transaction tax. Now, after, after decades of, of advocating for it, it came about because Sarkozy, 
uh, was faced, this is a couple of elections ago, was, thought he was going to lose uh, and thought he needed to say something about how he was actually on the side of, of workers and said, oh, I'll, this is in the context of the financial crisis. So I suppose he said, we're going to tax finance, right? Because I'm on the side of ordinary workers. Um, and then um, uh, the socialists came out and said the same thing. And before you know it, Europe is, is talking about having a financial transaction tax. Sarkozy is not a socialist. I mean, Sarkozy is the most right-wing president that France has ever had. It occurred because he fell under electoral pressure. And the same with the BEPS process. The BEPS process occurred because David Cameron, again, no socialist, uh, was under domestic political pressure because of the parliamentary inquiry in the, in the British Parliament and felt that he had to do something about tax, about tax and inequality so to show the population he was on their side. He said, I know, we're having the, G the, the G8. I'll put on the G8 agenda. Um, both of these tax reforms came about because of political pressure from very right-wing politicians. Um, and, and that's because the debate was had. So, so having the debate uh, is, is a victory in itself. But maybe not so much because they care about inequality, but because they see that they lack money for the national budgets as well. I mean, we had a, a fall here in Norway with a lot of quarreling about the, the national budget. What I did see in the media was anyone trying to, uh, to see how much money Norway is losing every year to, uh, to tax havens or, or corporations to avoid paying tax and setting that up against the relatively small mon uh, numbers that they're quarreling about in the, in the national budget. Did anyone see that? Do you have any idea what the numbers are? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't get so, so, what amount of of, uh, of tax money is being you know is disappearing from Norway every year, and how does that compare to to some of the posts in the in the national budget, for example? I don't know, and I think I don't think anybody really knows. They have guesses. My guess is that eight percent, which is the world average. Uh, eight. Eight. Eight, eight I think not eight percent is lost, but eight percent of the financial wealth is placed in tax havens. In Norway, that's my that's my guess. You know, and uh, but as as you know, for example, ship owners they had a lot of uh, secret wealth that uh, how could we know at all? Uh, they searched for ten years uh, after he had extends uh, fortune. Uh, so I so who knows? So uh, but I think these these are going to be raw guesses. Uh, but could that be a way to educate the Norwegian public on this? I mean, showing, get, trying to estimate that number and showing how that relates to, to I mean, the deficits in our health budgets or, you know. I, I think that's one way, but uh, I also think that the mechanisms are equally important as a specific number. A specific number is normally wrong. Mechanisms are normally more right, and then people can sort of... It's not to have the exact number, it's not uh, the most important, I think, but, but to, to understand the unfair mechanism. I think people react naturally to things that are considered to be unfair, unjust. And, and then you tell them more concretely about these things, that they, it is legal to do this, but it is unfair. And therefore, we should react and we shouldn't be legal to do this. And we should uh, be... Um, as I said, if you have more boycott towards uh, countries in which tax savings are placed. And it is an advantage that some of these countries are not so small, because then the boycott uh, hurts more. So uh, if, they were, if, they had, if the fraction of income in the country was basically uh, from tax savings, having the tax saving, that would be difficult to boycott, because they, they wouldn't be harmed so much. But since these countries do other things as well, the EU can easily boycott uh, Switzerland, for example. And, and the, the, the Swiss government will immediately uh, have to instruct their banks that this is the conditions under which you should operate in Switzerland. And, and I, so I, I can't really understand all people, politicians talking about this, that they are, not, they are completely unwilling to do the very simple thing of boycotting, mm. which... Uh, <coughs> And uh, for long periods of time, in the last 20 years uh, or so, when this has really become a problem, we had, have had social democratic or left leaning governments in, in many parts of Northern Europe for a long time. We talked about uh, unionizing and, and uh, the importance of that. These are parties traditionally linked with the labor unions. Why haven't they been able to uh, protect the people? If, I mean, it, it seems like you, see, you say that that's, that's sort of the job of the, of the unions, or the unions are in a good position to do this. The parties linked to the unions are, have not been doing this job, obviously. Why not? 
Uh, <laughs> you're the union guy. <laughs> uh, I do think that, I, mean, I mentioned in my talk that in the late 80s and early 90s, the structure of the economy shifted profoundly. <coughs> and I do think that, that, I mean, so a lot of things stayed the same, but the way in which they happened changed. And I, and I think for, it coincided with, a, with an increase in, in, in living standards. And so nobody thought they needed to, to, to really think about it any differently. But over time, the consequences have, un, have unwound. And the global financial crisis was perhaps the pinnacle of that. Um, and and it, was a, it was a wake up call. Um, but I do think that it's taken us a while to, 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 to understand the consequences of what was going on. Uh, and I think labor unions are, are getting it more and more now, and workers are getting it more and more now. Um, and part of it was the way in which labor unions saw their relationship to political parties. And I think, you know, these are, these are big institutions, and, and, the, and shifting relations take, take time. Um, but I do think that that, 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 is, uh, that is occurring. And part of it is because there was just a certain degree of hegemony. I mean, there was, there was a, a hegemony in the popular discourse, and some of it continues today, that says that markets will fix everything, uh, that what we need, I mean, we, we saw, at, at, within six months of the, of the global financial crisis, we had, we had the, the geniuses from Wall Street telling us that what we really needed was more liquidity in the market. The problem was we didn't have enough liquidity, that's why we were regulated. What we need to do is get, get rid of all that pesky regulation. It was the fact we had so much regulation that caused the problem. <laughs> this is an extraordinary denial of, of, of facts, but it was allowed to, to, to roll on because there was a certain degree of hegemony. And, and, and rolling that back and, and, and challenging that does take time. And I think the unions here in Norway do a particularly good job of doing that, frankly. Um, I, I won't speak about the political parties, but I think the, the unions are doing an excellent job here um, of, of challenging that and rolling back. Oh. Uh, I think the, the last time the, the unions in Northern Europe were really progressive in, in international issues, uh, in, international discussion that was under uh, fighting apartheid in, in South Africa. And that, that points to something that it, for unions, it's much easier to, to act if there is a union in the country uh, that you're going to support or that fighting the same. And, and as we, we all know, unions in South Africa have played a very progressive role in, 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 the, in fighting apartheid. Um, we also have to understand that they, in say unions in, in France, they they are less than twenty percent in membership, but they have an they're unpopular because they have an influence uh, over seventy percent of the workers and organizing thirty percent of them or less. We, that's that's not very good to, to talk about which party is the party of unions in France, I I don't know. Uh, but it, it's a it, it's final thing that is a major difference across countries that in Northern Europe, then the unions were very happy from the start to organize from bottom up. That they have very, they have even the lowest paid workers in the union. And if you go take Latin America, for example, then uh, the unions are, and Africa, unions are middle class uh, institutions. They, are, they don't organize people who are the poorest. And they have also middle class interests. Uh, so, uh, we have, very often we have the same name for organizations that are very different. Unions in, in the US for a while were highly uh, corrupt. They were mafioso organizations and, and, and they had the same name as unions in Sweden uh, that were very progressive at the same time. So it, it, I, I think it's, it, it's important to characterize the institutions that we are talking about. And many unions don't feel that they have a political party. So uh, the, the topic of this um, conference is making transparency possible. Um, John, how much would sort of transparency solve, solve this issue? I mean, how much would transparency help? Uh, I know that's a very general question. Um, but try to, I, I'm just trying to link transparency to this in other way. There's no doubt that, that you know, transparency efforts, which are either waged at an international level or waged at a national level, are extremely important. And in contexts such as Colombia, but also elsewhere, there's no doubt about that. But I think that we also have to recognize as well is that, that, that mechanisms, um, sort of formal mechanisms for transparency, formal mechanisms for governance, don't always work. Uh, and unfortunately, they, they, they are themselves, uh, it's possible to be, that they become manipulated, that they become corrupted themselves. Um, unfortunately, legal systems don't always operate according to the law. Uh, there are ways in which 
uh, corporations circumvent regulations, circumvent laws, or look for loopholes in order to essentially you know, support their own case or to delay the cases of those that they are uh, opposing or in confrontation with. So <laughs> there is then, you know, in, on the one hand, transparency, yeah, it, it has an importance, but actually what I see is that actually there's more the general field of politics that actually has more importance. There's, there's, there's still work to be done, that dirty work of politics, that dirty work of, of trying to fight for your case through uh, political parties in the Congress, in the Senate, um, in the stru different structures of government, it, with, at, the le at the level of municipal government, at the level of regional government, of, of uh, pushing your MP, of going out in the street and protesting, of, go of, I mean, of all of this, all of this action uh, surrounding it should also work in parallel with transparency structures. If we're just going to rely on transparency and rule of law, we're not going to get very far. There's too much there that can be manipulated and, and circumvented. So we really have to have also other pressures that pressure also an insistence that transparency is taken seriously. On that note, what within transparency do you see for, for sort of waking up workers and unions? What is, are the most important things that can be done? Um, Daniel. I'm going to start by saying I couldn't have said that better myself. I, mean, that's, I think that's exactly right. That is the point. Um, that it's about power it's a, and it's about politics and, it, and it, that's actually not an easy thing to do. It's a lot harder to do that than it is to, to read a paper and, and say, well, that's a, a great argument. I'll just post it off to, to the finance minister and everything will be fixed. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a, an interaction between the level of organisation you can do that can create change to the system and then having a system then that facilitates uh, further political action. And so, for example, you, there's things you, you can do in Norway that you can't do in Colombia because you know, there's this repressive government. And so you change, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dynamic system, uh, if, you, if you like. The other thing I'd say is we should also distinguish between unions and workers. Um, and I think this is another thing that I think the Norwegian unions are, are, are coming to grips with, but really um, a, a lot better than many other European unions. Um, and that is, is that you need a strong union. To have a strong union, you need to have people joining the union. That indicates a level of support and commitment. But in fact, all power actually comes from uh, having uh, workers taking concerted action. And, and that requires you to go beyond just your union uh, base. And there are many unions who regard themselves as craft unions, who won't speak to non-union workers. And I think, that is, I think that's being challenged all over the world as a, as a tactic to, to build power because it tends to be um, a, losing, uh, a losing tactic. And this point about municipal, I think, is absolutely critical as well. Uh, and perhaps it's not surprising that the municipal unions in, in Norway are, are doing some of the... And, and the nurses' unions, for example, who are actually very closely connected to people, are actually doing some of the most interesting work in terms of reconnecting and, and, and building our power. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a, that's a coincidence. Um, the final thing I'd say about France is, it, is, it, is I think it's 7% is the union density in France. It's, it's, it's astonishingly low. Um, but uh, they still can't get pension reform through and they still can't change the labour laws because uh, when the unions, who are hated, I mean, I, I've got to say, union, I mean, I, I talk to unionists, of the 7%, so you know, they're hard to find, and they often tell me how horrible unions are, <laughs> even though they're in the unions. But when the unions call a strike and, and want to shut the place down because the pensions are trying to be changed, um, the country gets shut down, and that's because workers respond to the call. So it's important to remember that unions, are, unions and workers are not necessarily the same thing, although there is a, a very important relationship. God. I think transparency is extremely important, uh, but it's also important to be informed. Uh, and I think in many places in the world, people are uninformed about the benefits of smaller differentials between people more egalitarian income distribution, bigger welfare states, higher taxes. They are uninformed about the gains of that. But countries that had that, say Sweden and Norway, had higher economic growth uh, than the US. And people think that they, they, they have for so long time been un or misinformed that these things are a drag on, on <coughs> development in a very narrow sense defined by economic growth. Not only that the economic growth has been at least as high as in the US, but it's also been given out equally on uh, every group, more or less, every group, more or less, in, in, the, in the Swedish society is to keep knowledge out of the picture. Um, so I think these things that are 
it is transparent and informed. And this is very important because we are moving into a sort of fact-free uh, political discussion. Everybody said, no, I, I, it's not like that, it's, it's like that. And then there's a yet another wild description. So I think that for people are, I've gotten an education paid by uh, the rest of society. There, there are some sort of things that uh, we should be aware of. It, it is not <coughs> very political to be interested in important questions. We should just give contingent uh, responses. If you really want to get rid of tax havens because of that and that reason, then it is possible to do that and that. And it, it, this is not, many people are so afraid of politics. It, it's not. This is normal advice. Uh, if so, then you can give you this and this and this. Uh, of course, we don't d determine more than you do, but uh, this is uh, the experience, or this is a thought I have. Or I think to be interested in important questions, I think that is the, the key, <coughs> both to be more transparent and to be more informed. Um, so yeah, we need to finish, so. Just, one, just this point about injustice that Carla made as well. I mean, unions grow when they talk about injustice. Um, and I think the, the, the tax justice movement grows when they talk about justice. Um, I think we all, you know, in, in creating that contingent proposal, the starting point is injustice, then I think uh, we all will be better. Mm. Uh, journalists have to try to turn these questions into clickbait in some way so, so papers also make money off of it. Because uh, one thing is transparency leads to more information, but I mean, we're bombarded with information every day today, and it's actually turning that information into something valuable that people notice, uh, which is the job of journalists. And then we have to just hope that their editors will let, let them spend their work time on it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all three.